Hello everyone and good afternoon. Thank you for being with us today to participate in this webinar organized by School Education Gateway, the initiative of the European Union founded by Erasmus+. Plus. My name is Marta and I'm very happy to support this webinar together with my colleague Eleonora. Today's focus is tackling online bullying in school. Stephanie Fichner is a media education consultant at the media authority Rhineland Palatinate works for the German Safer Internet Center KickSafe and was also a member in the Selma project against online hate speech. Stephanie will give an introduction to cyberbullying, presenting anti-bullying measures and showcases practical projects for the classroom. So this is our agenda for today. Some practical information for you. This webinar will be recorded and the recording will be available in the webinar page as of tomorrow. Thank you very much for submitting the questions in the Padlem. From now on, if you have uh, questions, you please post them in the chat and we will have a Q&A session at the end to address all of them. Without further ado, Stephanie, if you are ready, I'm very happy to give you the floor. Welcome. Hi, so now I can start sharing my screen, right? Yes. So you will see. Um... No, it's not working. <laughs> no worries. Do you see my presentation? Not yet. Not yet, wait. We tested it. Um, um, share now. Wait a second. Yeah, do not worry. OK, great. You see it now. OK, hello, yes, everyone. Perfect. My name is Stephanie and I work for ClickSafe, um, the German Safe Internet Center, and we raise awareness to all kinds of online safety topics and digital well-being topics. And we produce a, a vari variety of different materials, information materials for parents. We produce teaching materials um, for, for educators and also brochures and leaflets for young people. Um, some of our materials are also available in English, so you might find them useful for your own work and you can check out our website clicksafe.de of course you can also have the presentation so you don't have to take notes all of the time um, today i was invited to speak about cyberbullying and i'd like to introduce our handbook with the title what to do about cyber mobbing systemic intervention and prevention in school um, in case you're wondering mobbing is the german word for bullying um, i don't know why they kept it in the translation but i'll use bullying as it is uh, the more common word um, I'll show it into the camera. As you can see, it's um, quite extensive and it consists both of a theoretical input as well as um, a number of practical projects for the classroom. So in this webinar today, um, I can only touch upon some things. Um, so please feel free and deep dive afterwards. Um, you can download the material for free and you can start working with it. Um, before we get started, let me say thank you for being here today. Um, I don't know about the situation in your countries with COVID right now, but in Germany the last year has been extremely tough for teachers with remote teaching, schools closing and reopening and closing again. Um, so I know the situation in many places is far from perfect and we are in this mess together. And we know that when we are, we are in touch with uh, students, young people, face-to-face -face exchange is absolutely viable. And in many cases, this is missing right now. Um, sometimes the technical infrastructure is difficult. In almost all cases, the workload has increased. Um, so it's a really great challenge to understand what is causing problems uh, for children and, and young people if you don't see them regularly. Um, this being said, let's talk about cyberbullying. Um, this is a chart from, from a German survey about um, media use of young people. We know that during the pandemic, um, young people uh, turn towards online media. They use uh, digital media more often. Um, and this might also lead to an increase in cyberbullying. Um, kids are stressed out, sometimes they are bored. And just because they don't see each other regularly, it doesn't mean that bullying stops. Um, the, they have, in many cases, the opportunity to bully its present. 
Um, and if we are thinking about grown-ups, many parents are really exhausted. They have to work from home. They have to homeschool their children. And teachers, in many cases, they seem further away than usual. Um, so it is really important that we do not lose sight of the social togetherness of, of students during the pandemic. It's important to teach them English or maths, but also the social togetherness is really also um, very, very important because this pandemic really com completely turned everything upside down for, for young people, of course, as well. Um, I checked several sources and it really seems that cyberbullying is on the rise during COVID. You have the links here, so if you're interested, you can have a look at it later on. So let's talk about numbers. Um, we know from different studies that about one third of all young people say that they have witnessed forms of bullying in their surrounding. It doesn't mean that they have been a victim themselves, but one in three young people says that they have experienced um, bullying in their surrounding. Um, and if we talk to um, social workers, teachers, uh, people who work with um, classes regularly, they say, well, in most classes, one or two students are, are regularly attacked by their classmates. So I think these numbers, they show that professional treatment of, of cyberbullying is absolutely necessary and it, it shouldn't just be the responsibility of individual teachers, um, but ideally it would be that both bullying prevention and also interventions should be systematically implemented in all schools as this is such a huge topic. and. Uh, also not uh, just in secondary schools, um, but it would also be best to start at the end of elementary school already um, because we know that most bullying cases occur between the age of 13 and 15. So we would need time in advance to start prevention projects, social training, um, to prepare and to improve the situation. So I know we cannot solve this here today, but it's a call to action actually, and we keep saying this all the time. So this is a call for action for politicians, for school management, they are responsible for the climate in schools, um, for the individual teachers to play their part, to do what they can to, for social workers, and ideally all those different groups involved start, should, should be start, start to work uh, together. Um, this is one lesson learned. Um, ClickSafe, our, our work, um, we, we are dealing, um, we have been dealing with cyberbullying for a long time and actually we are experts in providing pedagogical materials for prevention. But our experience shows that prevention simply isn't enough. It's a little bit like learning to swim. You cannot really learn to swim if you stay outside of the water. So you have to be exposed to the water in order to learn to swim. And it's a little bit similar with um, bullying. Um, prevention projects are absolutely fine. I'm doing them, you might be doing them, but bullying might still be happening. Um, so there needs to be a plan. That's why we need in intervention also to be able to stop it. Um, this is our lesson learned and so that's why we teamed up with um, experts in intervention to develop this interdisciplinary approach. Um, we don't have time today to go into all those intervention methods and also I am not trained in doing interventions. I do prevention work, um, but I know that it's really important and this is a call. It should be really important that schools are aware of it, that they have like one or two teachers in a school that do an intervention practice or that they have external experts who could come into the schools and could do those interventions. But um, let me point out only trained staff should do those interventions because if other people do it, it might just become worse. Um, here you can see our handbook and the table of contents. Um, today I will pick out some tiny parts of it so you, you will get an impression what it's about. So I'll start with some background information on cyberbullying, talk a little bit about specific characteristics of online bullying. Um, I will also talk about the um, dynamics of bullying to understand the phenomenon. And um, I'll show you our 10 basics for emergencies. So this is very concrete advice and also point to some pitfalls. So things that you should avoid in dealing with bullying. 
And in the briefing call, I was also told to put a focus on practical projects, so I'll walk you through some of our projects for the classrooms. And I looked at the Padlet yesterday, so I, I will try to keep some time for questions later on. If we don't have the time, I could also answer them, of course, in the Padlet um, later on. Maybe you've realized that there are different ways of writing the cyberbullying, and uh, we usually write the cyber in brackets. So bullying would be like the offline bullying exclusively. So the cyber hyphen bullying, that would be the online bullying part and the cyber in, in brackets bullying. Um, this is the combination of online and offline bullying, and we usually write cyberbullying because it's uh, the logical consequence of the media habits of young people. If you think of young people, they don't say, I go online, like my parents say sometimes. For them, online and offline really is intertwined, and we know that most bullying cases, they take place both offline and online, so there usually is uh, a connection. But we, what we have to say is that there are some typical characteristics for the online part, so the cyber hyphen bullying. Um, and I think it's important to understand them why this topic is so um, really has so many effects on young people. Um, the first aspect is like, there has always been bullying, but back in the days when I was in school, you could go home, you could close the door and you would keep it out. Today, that's no longer possible. We have a complete loss of, of the private sphere, because if you think that if people are bullied in school, they go home and then they are bullied online, it's there 24 seven. So it, it, it's way more dramatic because you, can, you have no time off. Um, it's there 24 seven. Also, the second point, um, it's today it's way more difficult to stay in control of your data. If you just think about how easy it is to take pictures, to take videos, to share them, to spread them, how fast and easy you can reach a large number of people. And sometimes without the consent of the person that is shown in the picture or video, this can hardly be controlled. It's almost impossible. Um, on the other hand, um, the bullies can act anonymously. Um, of course, you can check their IP addresses, but for a long time, the victims, they might have an idea because usually they know the person, but they are not always sure and the person can act anonymously to a certain extent. And also for the bullies, um, it's quite easy to stay emotionally detached. They don't have to look them in the eye. They don't see how much they hurt the others and um, in many cases, they know they want to hurt someone, but sometimes it starts as fun and they are not aware of how much damage they actually cause in other people if they don't see them face to face. Um, what's the connection with cyber bullying, bullying and schools? Well, basically bullying can happen anywhere, but usually it happens in forced group whenever you cannot walk away from a situation. So it is more likely to happen in schools or also at work, but then we are talking about grown ups and they are usually better in defending themselves. Um, the interesting question is why do people bully? Um, what's what's the fun in insulting or threatening other people? Um, well, basically some people, they have a desire for, for recognition, for power and for status. That's absolutely fine. But some of them, they want to strengthen their role within a group at the expense of others. And usually this happens very early on when a group comes together. So at the beginning of the school year or when they have a new teacher or if there is a new student in the class. So whenever there are major changes or a new group is formed, um, they try out um, who is suitable for suppression. The motives can be different, can can just start as fun. It can be a demonstration of power. It can be revenge. It can be envy. In some cases, it can also be the fear of becoming a victim themselves. Um, and not always um, are the bullies aware um, of, of the suffering of the victim. Um, so this is, uh, in, in my opinion, a reason for really doing early prevention and also doing social emotional learning projects where children learn to talk about their feelings and they learn to understand what other people are feeling. Um, in a situation where uh, the bully is successful, 
others you see the, them here as a group but usually they are not like one group but others they might join in and assist um, that's usually like the second row um, some of them they are what we call them clickers um, so they are an interested audience so they like to watch um, but there are many members of the group who do not participate those are the ones we call bystanders and the bystanders have a huge potential. Um, if they are the bigger group, uh, the bully will not be so successful. And some of the bystanders, they could also be defenders. They could help the victim because they really think they have something like a moral compass. Uh, they think what is happening is wrong. So they feel committed to what we call um, the formal framework of values. For instance, something like human rights, basic rights, um, or also the school norms. So who becomes a victim? Um, basically, anyone can become a victim. And during this um, testing stage, the offenders try out how others react. So they randomly choose hooks. Um, hooks are personal attributes, and this can be anything. Um, it could be hair, it could be long hair, short hair, dark hair, green hair, no hair. They just um, pick out one feature that makes a person different, and every person has something that makes them different. And then they wait for a response. So if someone very consequently says, says stop, it might just end there. It might just be one attack. And if they are not successful, they might to try to identify someone else. Um, but many people don't know how to defend themselves. So many of them, they don't say anything. Um, many suffer in silence for a long time. And after some time they react, but in a way, I don't know, they start to cry in the classroom, for instance, and then they get attention from the teacher, from adults. That really doesn't make you popular in the group. Or other students, they, they don't start to cry, but they lose control, so they scream or they shout. So every, everyone starts saying how oh, he's really weird or she's really weird. Remember just how she screamed. I, I didn't really do anything, but it took a long time until they lost control. Um, so you can see this self defense aspect is also um, very important for prevention because if young students learn how to defend themselves in a nonviolent way, um, they will probably not be a victim of cyberbullying. Um, and the third factor is uh, the lack of support from others. So usually the ones, you know, they're always outsiders. They don't really belong to the group. They are usually easy targets because they don't have anyone who will stand up for them. And what about the teachers? Um, in many cases, adults, um, both parents, but also the teachers, they don't know what's happening within the groups of young people and they find out about bullying quite late. So usually um, there is something that, like a generation boundary and when it comes to stuff that is happening online, usually that is noticed quite late by adults. And by the time the adults um, realize something is going on, the formal framework, so stuff like basic rights, human rights, school law, it has shifted towards dissocial values. So this is the new norm, the dissocial values, they become the new norm. And if it goes on undetected for a long time, those dissocial values will be manifested in the group and it will be really difficult to find support for the victim. So the sooner uh, they find out about a bullying situation, the better it is. Um, one can, what can teachers do to act early on? Um, prevention wise, um, uh, I would, I said usually it starts when a group is formed. So uh, at the beginning of the school year, it would be really good to do group bonding activities. Everything that strengthens the we factor, we say, um, is a good thing and it could help to avoid bullying. Um, in Germany, usually uh, we do something like social training at the end of the school year after there are no longer any tests. Um, <laughs> we do social trainings. Actually, it would be better to do it in the beginning of the of the school year. Um, anything that can help the group formation process when a group comes together 
uh, will be helpful. But also during the school year, um, creating a framework of working and living together also helps to reduce the probability that people will bully. Um, ritualized communication spaces are very important. Also right now during to the pandemic to give them ritualized communication spaces online. Um, so time like an hour a week where young people can address their topics. Um, this is really important, um, not just focusing on, on English and math and stuff like that. Um, young people also need to know about norms and values. What behavior is accepted? This has to be clear and it also needs to be checked. And also they need to know that there will be sanctions uh, in, in case they misbehave, um, that there this should really be clear to anyone there will be sanctions so they have to agree to those terms now i'm uh, wait a second now my presentation is lost okay now okay um yeah so young people need to know which behavior violates a norm and how to protect themselves again physical and emotional threats and i'll show you a project later on so this is not just theoretical but it becomes more clear i think if you if you see the practical project um what to do if bullying happens um bullying is usually a complex situation with many different players um, it's not just about the victim and the offender but usually there is a whole system or a group of people involved and in order to resolve their conflict um, the whole group should be involved um, of course the main goal is to stop the bullying um, but it's also very important to differentiate between behavior and person to, so to say I like you, you're a cool person, but it is not OK what you said or it's not OK what you did. So differentiate between behavior and person. Um, also encouraging pro-social behavior of the group. So pro-social behavior means that I do have needs, but other people also do have needs and I respect that. So finding a way that my needs and the needs of person, other person are somehow in balance. Um, and also it's very helpful to establish a sustainable system of help. So who needs what? Uh, when bullying happens, um, the easy solution is usually to point fingers, you know, like uh, the bully who did it. The bully is in the center, but actually the victim should be in the center. It should be most important to offer protection and to help them and find a way to get them back into the group. I think that's the most important part when it comes to bullying. Um, of course, there have to be sanctions um, as sometimes even you know the police you could press charges but when we talk about the bully from a pedagogical point of view uh, it's in our understanding it's very important that he or she understands what what he has done and giving them the opportunity to change their behavior in the future so something like a new start um yeah um the parents that's a tricky point um, usually the parents should be informed about the steps that are being taken, but uh, they shouldn't act themselves. I will tell you in a minute why we think um, they should be kept out at first. School management, on the other hand, has a very crucial role. Um, they, of course, should be involved. They're, ideally, there should be a structured approach. Um, it should be clear what, how to handle bullying cases, which procedures do you, do you have, who is involved, which steps are taken. Uh, if you have a structured approach, this is how we do it. When we have cases of bullying, uh, it will be easier for anyone. Um, for the teachers, um, it would be really good if, if they are part of a team that makes decisions together because maybe it's the first time that you have a bullying case in your class, but maybe there was a bullying case in another class. So it would be good to talk to the teacher of the other class. Maybe there is someone who is trained in doing interventions. So it would be good to include them. It would be good to have social workers, psychologists as part of this team. So for the teachers, it would be really good not to be there alone, but to have team support um, and for the class it's very important to have orientation about the values and norms that are accepted um, this is our uh, short instruction for emergencies so this is something practical at hand 
uh, that you can use if you're not, um, you, if you don't have like this systemic conflict management in your school. So um, if a person uh, turns to you and, and uh, tells you about a bullying case, um, of course you should ask about what has happened. Also talk about the feelings of the person in need and here offer good relationship and a safe place. Don't make the person regret that um, he turned towards you because usually if you think about it, it takes a long time until they actually talk to an adult and they are usually in a lot of pain. And usually with teenagers, adults are not always seen as trustworthy persons. So um, offer a good relationship and a safe place. So they should have the feeling that we are in this together. I'm the adult, I'm the strong one, we can handle this. Um, and explain what you plan to do and make a joint decision. So the young person has to agree to the steps that are being taken. If they say, no, I don't want this, it would be very problematic if you still did it. So make joint decisions about the next steps. Um, it's also very important to check self endangerment. So is there really a dangerous situation going on? Is the young person thinking about harming themselves, something like that? Um, really, is there a danger? Um, and also discuss how to de-escalate the situation. Um, define your role and position. So you should uh, ask the person really about their wishes. What do they want? You should agree on the future communication and if other people should be involved and who those people should be. Um, in many cases, we have a peer involvement, peer counselors, um, so something like a buddy or help system. This is something that you should clarify. Um, sometimes it can happen that someone contacts you and then um, they don't cooperate. Um, so if, if the victim help, yeah, the, they refuse to get help, try to stay in touch and try to offer help because at some point they might just, you know, back off. Um, so try to stay in touch. Um, it's also very important uh, that you document the case. It's really a key element because if you think about a situation, you will hear different perspectives from different people. So it's important that you document it because after a couple of weeks, you might not remember what they, who told you what. Uh, it's also important to have evidence and we offer standardized um, interview shoots so you could use something like that. Um, and also, of course, you should check who should be involved. Um, that really depends on the case. So the next point would be like police question mark. That would be only, of course, for severe cases. If you've tried all the pedagogical means, if, if mediation has failed, the, the family might think about contacting the police. Um, but this doesn't have to be in all cases. Um, and external experts are also important whenever you have the opportunity to team up with others. Anyone who could help you in this situation is obviously welcome. Um, there are some pitfalls. Um, the first one, individual talk with the victim won't stop the cyberbullying. Um, so in some cases, you know, just talking to the victim, this might lead to irritation if the group realizes, you know, there is someone and he's talking to the teacher and he gets special attention. The group might feel disadvantaged and it might even reinforce the bu bullying if it's not transparent or if it's behind their backs. So this should be clear in some way why this person is talking to you. Um, interventions by parents. Um, parents always want to protect their child no matter what. So this, if, if the parents are involved, this might escalate to the parents' uh, level. Um, so it could make things worse. So at first, try to keep the parents separated. Later on the process, if everything is going fine, you could bring them together. But at first, try to be take, yeah, leave them separated. Um, the third point, promptly threatening to punish offenders. Um, punishment of bully, that usually gets a lot of um, attention. And in some cases, it might make sense to punish um, a person. 
there are also different methods in, in the handbook of, of sanctions of different intervention approaches. Um, there are some approaches like the no blame approach that really doesn't punish at all, um, but it really depends on the gravity of the case, but the punishment shouldn't be like the main measurement that you take. But what is really important is point number four is the aftercare. Um, aftercare is really important and this should go on for a longer period of time. So we are talking here about a couple of months and this should also be controlled because if you just have something like an intervention and then you say, OK, it's fine, it is very likely that it might start again. So aftercare for for a longer period of time is very important. Um, victim blaming. Um, is another factor. Sometimes those people who are attacked, they behave strangely and sometimes uh, in the class people even talk about it, you know, like he acts strangely, it's his own fault. Um, talking about strange behavior of a person will lead to new harassment, so this is also very problematic. Um, uh, urging the victim to defend themselves, um, I talked about self-defense earlier on with non-violent means. That's like at an early stage, okay, but if um, someone is bullying, bullied by a group for a longer period of time, the victim is in a weaker position. So just calling on self-defense um, is not very helpful. And the same is with um, point number seven, expecting the class to solve the problem themselves. No, they are young people. They are not always able to solve the problem themselves. Um, also, discussing the problem with the class in many cases isn't enough. So there should be um, a structured procedure and not just, yeah, we'll talk about it and then we move on. That's not enough. And also point number nine, nine um, information briefings with um, a cognitive emphasis. So just merely, you know, understanding about a phenomenon is also not enough. It's also about the emotional aspects. Ideally, the, the group should understand also on an emotional level what has happened. So ideally, they're touched by what has happened. So they are moved or shaken. So uh, understanding with the brain isn't enough. Also speaking about the emotional part that will be helpful. OK, so this um, was uh, the theoretical part. Um, I think it becomes clear if I go on and show you some projects. I think we have um, enough time. Then if there are no uh, immediate questions, I would go on with the practical project if that's fine for everyone. So um, I can continue and then we can take the question. OK, so um, I would really like to use the remaining time um, to show you some practical projects for the classrooms. Um, these are all prevention projects, so any teacher can use them without any specific training. Um, of course, they were produced for Germany, but um, many materials we use are also available in English. And in some cases, if it doesn't fit your country, um, I think many projects can easily be adapted um, to other countries, so I'm pretty sure that anyone can find something of interest here. Um, this is the overview. In total, the handbook has 11 projects. Uh, I, I don't have time to go into all of them, but I'll just quickly show you some of them. And of course, if you if you want, you can dive in and you can download it and try it out yourself. Um, the first couple of projects are really basic projects to understand the phenomenon um, of uh, bullying. Usually um, we start with some fictional examples, so we use a lot of uh, videos. Um, for instance, uh, we analyze different bullying situations. Um, we have here a, a series of videos that were um, produced by the Finnish Safer Internet Center. Uh, they are available with um, subtitles in, in several languages, so we made them in German. I know they are also available in English. So um, they treat different bullying situations from different perspectives, and so we show them to the class. Um, we also give them guiding questions, and then the students discuss in small groups um, their own perspective, and then they present their responses and at the end of the lesson they come up with a definition of what bullying is. Just to be clear, not every joke is bullying, but to work out really the characteristics that it is for a longer time, that it's more severe forms of, of attacking a person, stuff like that. Um, 
We have another project um, where students reflect the different roles and the dynamic in cyberbullying. So this is what I talked about um, earlier on. Um, here we use a video from the UK Safer Internet Center. Uh, you might know it. It's the one it's called Let's Fight It Together. It's actually quite old. Uh, we always talk about do we still use it because they have those old big phones, but I've used it several times and it works really well with younger students because it emotionally touches them and we don't have the same experience with newer videos. So we still use it and um, then we ask the young people about the different characters So we have the victim offender. We have those assistants. We have the adults who for a long time don't know what's going on. And so we talk about how they act in the movie, why they think they act like this. So to understand the reasons for their behavior, also talking about the different perspectives, uh, why a person behaves like, like they do. And very importantly, we talk about and what about us? What would we do? What could we have done differently? So we use uh, the fictional examples to think about um, yeah, different choices and how to turn a situation around. Uh, this is another project. Um, it's called Exclusion, Insults and Threats. Um, here we use um, different examples from social media. Here you see a screenshot from uh, Snapchat and we, we call it a gallery walk. So we have lots of uh, screenshots and pictures from the different social media channels. Um, if you don't see your students right now, you could also do it online in a Padlet, for instance. Uh, online gallery talk walk would also be possible. So they walk around, they have a look at different examples. Uh, we talk about the different types of damages. This is what you hear see here on the left side something like exclusion or insults spreading rumors etc and then we use it as a starting point for a discussion and I think this is really interesting because it shows how subject subjective the understanding is because in some groups it really differs some of them they think that like physical attacks if someone uh, threatens you know to beat you up that's the for them that's like the worst thing that could happen but in other cases those examples that are a bit more bit more supple and it's more about like psychological things how to you know like um how to to attack people um more more supple is, is seen as as worse by by the students so this is a really good starting point for uh, a discussion um, talking about what form would be worst for you. How do you think those people feel in a situation like this? Just to have this emotional understanding what people might feel if they are exposed in situations like this. Um, we have another project uh, where we um, focus on the, the consequences for the victims. Uh, here we also start off uh, with a video. You can see a screenshot here on the slide. Uh, this one is called Create No Hate. I don't know if, if anyone knows it. It was um, actually made by this boy in, uh, that you see here in the slide. Um, he was, as a teenager, he was bullied himself, so he made this video. Now he's a young adult. He's still very active in anti-bullying measures. And um, as you can see from the picture, um, the video shows uh, the emotional injury. So when he receives a mean message, uh, it's illustrated through um, bodily injury. So his nose starts to bleed. Um, so really visualizing the harms that could be done and what consequences uh, bullying can have for victims. And then we um, take it a step further. We have a fictional case. It's a story um, that we read together. It's about a teenage girl and in this uh, lesson, the students learn about the, the physical, the emotional, and also the social um, consequences of, of, in her case, being excluded uh, that bullying has in her case. And then um, we talk about um, what could we do uh, to support someone and to offer help. So some tasks are that they should write a friendly message, uh, give give the person um, some advice and we use uh, those um, yeah fictional examples to think about what you could do. Um, so those four first four projects they are very suitable as as basic prevention units um, to to understand the phenomenon of bullying, 
Um, I personally have used them a couple of times and usually I've combined the different lessons into a two hour introduction to bullying and that really works well with younger students aged 12, 13. So I think this is really a good um, prevention uni unit to start with. Fictional cases they can relate to, but it's not talking about their own personal experience, but having the general awareness. Something completely different is uh, this one. So if you want to give your student um, real hands on advice on how to delete, to block and to report content, um, this is also the technical means to stop cyberbullying. I'd recommend this project here. Um, we usually when we do it in the classroom, we call it um, we do um, a series of stations. So we have different tables with different devices where the students learn how to handle problems on various platforms with the help of um, technical options for reporting, um, blocking and deleting. So of course, in this case, uh, we would need tech devices. We would need laptops or tablets and smartphones, and we would have to install the different services. Um, but then they learn, they compare the different services. How does it work in WhatsApp? How does it work in Snapchat? Um, so they are aware of reporting mechanisms in social media. Um, we also offer them posters with solutions. Here on the right hand side, you can see the example from WhatsApp um, with step by step um, uh, uh, instructions uh, for both Android and iOS. Um, so this is really hands on about those technical things that you can do um, and this um, delete, deleting, blocking and reporting content is also part of our cyberbullying first aid app that I will show you in a few minutes. Um, I think this is a really interesting project. It's called avoiding harm in the class chat. I think this is really um, topical right now. Um, in this project, um, the students think about what um, bothers them about their classmates' behavior in their online communication channels. Um, it, it's very important. It's not about telling names, but it's generally about ways of behaving. And the more precise um, the description, the clearer it will be. Um, so what behavior is experienced as disturbing by the group? And in a first step, we just generally collect ideas. And then in a second step, uh, we categorize it. The students don't know at the beginning what the categories are, but I will tell you, of course, right now. So the first category would be danger. So for instance, if they tell something about that a stranger contacts them, something like that could be a danger or if they're exposed to really disturbing content this would also be like in the category danger um, then we have the second cat category which is um, violation of human rights usually we do this after the, the the project we have another project on human rights so they know what it is um, but basically um, a violation of human rights is if anyone um, threatens your body, your mind or your property. So they have this understanding. So we categorize all those violations of human rights. And the third one is um, all aspects um, of behavior that the class can regulate by themselves, like too many unnecessary messages. And of course, we um, discuss all of the categories with the young people. So what are the dangers that you face and what are the options for action? So if a stranger contacts you, do not reply. Um, if you're exposed to really disturbing content, don't share it with your class. Don't share it with your buddies. If it really bothers you, talk about it. Talk to someone who can help you. Um, for the human rights violation, so the harm that is done to body, mind or property, um, we make clear that this really is a problem. Um, I mean, legally, of course, those violations can have consequences, but as we are educators, uh, we think that school is a place to learn. So we say that behavior can be changed. So offering them a new start and we say, OK, from now on, this is no longer accepted. 
um, but it has to be clear that those violations will be addressed, ideally by the students. And this is a really tricky part. Uh, in, in German, we call it Petzen. In English, it's, it's tattling. It's the person who talks to the teacher, and that's usually not very popular. But here, the tricky point is that the group has to understand and to differentiate that see seeking help is not tattling, but seeking help is good. Um, and this has to be accepted by the group in order to work. Um, and then we make an agreement. And we also say there will be sanctions. And so we decide to come up with our rules for the classroom and for those uh, parts, uh, the third category, the student really negotiate them and then they make um, suggestions for their class class uh, ruled cl class chat rules, difficult word, and ideally the class votes the rules they would like to um, adopt um, for, for their class chat. Um, so I think this project can be re really helpful to, to avoid stress, also to talk about the dangers and also to talk about sanctions for misbehavior. Um, I have two more projects. Do we still have time? Yeah, I think we have a little bit more time. Um, another project is on digital self assertion and civil courage on the net. Um, in this project, um, students learn to defend themselves with uh, nonviolent measures. This is what I talked about early on that um, many students don't know how to defend themselves. Um, and also we teach them how to show civil courage. Um, so usually we um, yeah, talk about painful situation um, where self assurance is important and what we can do both offline and online and how you can do it because you can do it in different, way, different ways. You can, it depends on your person, on your personality. Um, you can confront someone um, or you can de-escalate um, a situation. Both is fine. There are different ways of doing things as there are also different persons. Um, so we say, okay, self-assertion offline. If you feel uncomfortable in a situation, you can walk away. Um, if you feel uncomfortable in a situation online, you can block the person. This would be like a de-escalative way of getting out of the situation. And then we have uh, several cases, I think, like 20 different cases and we talk in pairs of, of two people about the different cases and then they present their solutions. So here you can see one example. Stefan is invited by a classmate to be in an anti-Michael group. In the group everyone disses Michael and they share photos and videos that make Michael look like a fool. So we say, okay, what is our solution to the case? Uh, so for instance, they could say, okay, we he could just leave the group. That would be a de-escalation, but probably not very helpful for the other person. What else could we do? OK, um, we could be brave. Um, we could speak up for Michael, but that would be very confrontative. Who could do it? Do, you th do I think I could do it? Maybe who could do it best? Um, other things could be to ask the person to delete the group or if uh, in the group are really severe threats. Um, would it be helpful to get help from outside? So they could come up with their own solutions to, to those different cases. Okay, this is the last uh, um, example I'm going to show. It's called Living Together on the Basis of Human Rights. And um, here I've taken elements from various projects that deal with human rights. And um, usually we do a combination uh, also with social and emotional learning elements. I, I've spoken about this earlier on so that young people learn to speak about their feelings because sometimes it's really difficult. You ask them, how do you feel? And they say, OK, and that's the end of the conversation. So talking about your emotions is really something that you can practice and you have to be practiced to be to be able to talk about your emotions because we are not used to doing this regularly. And so we have something like warm up exercises uh, where the students are asked to give positive feedbacks to other people in the class uh, where they talk about what makes people feel good just to to be aware of those social and emotional learning elements. And on the other hand, of course, 
uh, not just about feeling good, but also what do we do if uh, violations are happen happening, um, if human beings are hurt, both online and offline, and we use this opportunity to talk about human rights. And this sounds very abstract, human rights, um, but we actually use the ones that are formulated um, in laws and declarations. So on the left hand side, you can see the United Nations Declaration. Uh, there is a simple version for young people available. I think it's not only for a young person, it's just good to understand. And so we talk to young people. These are your rights, um, but these are also your, your responsibilities. So you have the right to those things, but every other person has those same rights and that makes you responsible for respecting their rights. So, um, and it sounds a bit complicated to talk to young people, but actually they are kind of proud to know that they as children, they do have rights and also making them aware of their responsibilities um, as well. Um, yeah, then uh, in the middle you can see um, this chart where we um, collect situations where um, violations happen. So different situations where we talk about what happens, how it made them feel, um, talking about their feelings, and then we try to categorize it. So which human rights do you think um, was violated? Um, and on the right hand side, so once the students have those understandings of rights and responsibilities of human rights, um, you can think about uh, implementing something. We call them human rights of service, which sounds a bit abstract, but actually it's something like a body system. So we elect uh, those human rights observers in the classroom, and they, those are the people who pay attention in the classroom that no violations take place. Um, and the good thing about this is that the whole group has this understanding. This is their job, so it's not tattling or you know going to the teacher. Um, it's their job, and ideally, um, I mean, you should select those students who are socially capable, of course. But it can be something like a rotation. It's not just one or two person, and they have the whole burden. But it could be something that is rotating on a monthly basis, for instance, and they just check uh, what's going on, and they know, um, okay, if some serious is happening, um, how to get help or how to report um, those cases so it doesn't go undetected for a long time. OK, so this uh, were the practical projects. Let me check the watch. Um, this was the practical overview. Uh, I have one more thing, Marta, if that's yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah, you. you can go ahead. Um, I hope it was interesting uh, for you and um, if you want to find out more, you can really try the project uh, out yourself. Um, I'd like to show you one last project um, that we developed, and this is our cyberbullying first aid app. Um, this is a complete um, peer product. Uh, at ClickSafe, we have um, a youth panel um, that's a group of young people, and they volunteer at their school to be media scouts, um, and they teach younger students at their school. And we talk to them about cyberbullying, and they came up with the idea to develop an app because they said usually, you know, if something happens to you, you don't want to go and talk to adults at, as a first step. And so this is really only a first aid. Um, it doesn't solve the problems, but it helps young people to find out if they are able to manage a problem by themselves or if they need professional help and which steps should be taken and where they can find help. Um, so here you can see how it looks like um, in the middle picture. You see a boy and a girl. So we worked with um, young actors and uh, so we produced um, a couple of short videos um, where they directly talk to the young people. So they give them tips, they um, give them confirmation, positive emotional feedback and also um, working with videos with young people is also helpful because if they're in a stressed uh, situation, they don't usually don't want to read a lot of text. Um, of course, we also uh, offer a background information about bullying and cyberbullying, also in easy to understand language for young people. Um, we also I think it's very important to give them tips how to support others and not be a bystander. So we have uh, information on that. Um, we talk a little bit about legal aspects. Of course, this depends on, on the country and can be different from country to country. Um, 
And the app also um, contains tutorials for different social media services. This is what I've shown earlier on with a practical project. So here they learn with pictures, with screenshots, how to block, report and to delete uh, content really with a step by step approach. And also we have um, a list of uh, counseling services. Of course, this is all only uh, for our national context, but uh, the app is available in seven languages. It's available in German, in English, in French, in Luxembourgish, in Slovenian, in Lithuanian, and I forgot one more. So you can, but you can check it out in the app stores. Um, and if you find it interesting, you can of course promote it in your countries. OK, this is it from me. Um, I think we have a couple of more yes. minutes for <laughs> questions. I'm, I'm happy. I hope I can answer your questions. Um, I already took a screenshot from the from the um, Padlet. This was yesterday. I think some some more questions came in today, right? Yeah, exactly. And actually, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, for your presentation and for sharing all these projects with the with the participant. Just one thing before the Q&A session, one practical information. Please don't forget to complete the feedback form. You will find it in the chat in a while. Eleonora will post it and please make sure to save the link uh, before uh, before we close this webinar. But definitely now we have um, 10 minutes for uh, for the questions. So Stephanie, I don't know how do you want to proceed? Maybe I can read uh, the questions for you and you can reply. OK, um, yeah, give me. I, I, I yeah. might need so, some time to think about it, but yeah, <laughs> yeah give me questions. Sure. So we have one uh, really interesting question. Um, usually mockery and bullying are justified by joking there and there are those who accept it as a joke and there are those who get excited. Isn't it related to the person and his self-confidence? Um, yes, this is what I talked about. It's really interesting when we talk to young people, they have completely different understanding what is funny and what is not funny. Um, and sometimes the physical uh, threats are seen as way more serious than the ones that are uh, psychological um, or, or different kinds of attacks. Uh, but what you feel um, bully, so I think we need to have an understanding what bullying is. So if we have a definition, it's like, it's like severe attacks for a longer period of time. Um, if we understand what it can do to people, if, if the damages they they can cause, um, then I think they have a better understanding uh, what bullying is and what isn't bullying. Because sometimes I know here that in colloquial language, they say, hey, do you want to bully me? And that is just fun. So having an understanding of the phenomenon is really important, um, but also talking, really being able to talk about your feelings and also practicing this in school. So this aspect of social and emotional learning, I think is really important to be able to 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 look into other people and and realize what they are feeling and just because you think it's funny it might not be okay for the other person and there might be a point where you cross a line and i mean there are legal sanctions you know it's like when do you get to the point when the police has to be involved but this is like the last resort what about those things that happen earlier um if, if it's okay for you it's not okay for the other person so getting into a conversation because if it's fun then the person didn't really mean to harm other people this is something that we can talk about way more easily if they say you know it was just fun then you can say but it wasn't funny for me that it's way more easy to solve the situation if it was not intended to harm the other person thank you very much and we had another question uh, what is your opinion on of the sanctioned cases being made known to the entire school community, especially students? Um, I, I didn't really. Can you repeat it? Yes, sure. So what is the, um, what is your opinion on the sanctioned cases uh, being made known to the entire school community, especially to all the students? So maybe where there is a case and then um, is sanctioned, is punished, but you know, all the school uh, get to know it and all the students know about the person who um, is affected uh, by the Yeah, um, I think usually it's, it's not, 
I mean, I, I talked about this. It's important to involve the whole group and to talk about them. So uh, if it's a group of people and they are all involved in this, um, you know, as, as bystanders, um, as, as bullies, as assistants, it's important to work with the whole group and to be transparent about what's going on. I wouldn't talk to the whole school, entire school community about it. I think that would be too much. And it's really not uh, about the names of, of the people, you know, who did what or who was the victim. I mean, they will know it for sure, but it's about finding ways of strengthening them as a group together. So this punishing people or saying who is the victim that will victimize the person even more, but doing things that will strengthen the group are usually helpful. OK, thank you very much. And maybe we can take a couple of more question, uh, questions. Um, Leticia asked, um, probably bullying starts in preschool period. What can we do to prevent it from the beginning? In, in preschool? Preschool, yeah, period. Um, yeah, I mean, you would have to adapt it to um, their level, so it would have to be more suitable for for smaller children. Um, to be quite honest, we we don't do it for we don't work with students that young. We start working with uh, students at the end um, of elementary school, so usually they're around 10, 12 years old. You would have to adapt it to a younger age group, but I think when it comes to social and emotional learning, there are many uh, projects also available to have uh, materials for, for younger age groups. Um, I know that when we did the Selma project on online hate speech, we talked a lot about social and emotional um, activities and our project was also for students who were of an older age, but uh, I remember it was um, the, what's the name of the, Cassell, is that the name of the program? I think um, they have lots of activities for younger people that are more playful in easier language. So talking um, about social emotional learning can be done with children of, of a younger age. But to be quite honest, this is not our main target group. So I think the things we do, they are more suitable for students and uh, we would have to check if there is something available. But I know that, that those social and emotional learning activities are also available for younger children. Thank you very much. And we have one last question. Um, what if it is a teacher, the one who is bullied um, by the students? Yeah, that um, that is uh, also a very uh, tricky point. Uh, this could happen sometimes. Um, try to, to get help. I mean, it's like uh, talking about what is acceptable, what's not. I mean, it really depends on, on the situation. Um, we know that bullying it does happen among teachers, so try to get help. The same thing that we recommend for students, um, talk to other professionals uh, that are involved in bullying, talk to the people from your school. Is there something like a, you know, a teacher's union, a staff council, anything that could help teachers to get professional help um, to, to solve the, the problem with ideally experts from outside? If it's more severe cases, I would say. Okay, thank you very much, Stephanie, and thank you uh, very much for replying to, to the question um, that the audience uh, posted in the chat uh, during during the webinar. And before uh, we leave, I would like to point out two practical uh, things for the for the audience. Uh, first of all, please don't forget the feed, uh, to complete the feedback form. Uh, Eleonora will post again the link in the chat and you can also save it and fill it in later. Please, uh, one last thing, uh, note that no certificates uh, will be issued for this uh, webinar. And thank you very much all for participating. Uh, once again, thanks to Stephanie for being here and for the presentation and all the projects you, you shared with the, with the participant. Uh, if you want to say something uh, to close, you are uh, feel free, feel free to do it. Uh, I just say thank you for having me. <laughs> Hope it was, it was a, a pleasure. I think it's it was really interesting and inspiring for for the participants. Um, a lot of food for thought. So thank you very much.
And well, without further ado, uh, I wish you all a good evening and stay safe. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>